on cybersecurity in the and we have the pleasure to welcome today my colleague uh, from uh, Tahiti University Française du Pacifique, Alban Gabillon, and myself, Serge Miranda, in charge of the BR Master degree. And um, tonight we're going to talk about cybersecurity and I will, it, I will be very short. Uh, just to say that I look um, last week at the 20 jobs where, um, which are um, highly demanded and the most highly demanded on LinkedIn and the top one was uh, data security. So therefore, uh, it will be a pleasure to welcome you, uh, Alban. Uh, we already have your uh, lecture, which is um, recorded as a MOOC. And um, now you have uh, uh, one hour and then questions in order to talk to us about your vision, about cybersecurity um, in the different aspects and you're totally free to develop it. Just to say finally that this um, lecture is going to be recorded um, and uh, will be available on uh, YouTube and also on Datum Academy website um, anytime after the talk. Like the two previous one from Alex Ryan from University of Bilbao and myself are already available on Datum Academy website. So Alban, it's your it's your time. Thank you, Serge. So, hello, everybody. So, as uh, Serge said, I am Professor Alban Gabio. I am from the University of uh, French Polynesia in Tahiti. And first of all, I would like to thank Professor Serge Miranda for inviting me to make this presentation. And I will talk about uh, access control and authorization policies and more specifically about authorization policies in the web. So this is my first web seminar ever, so I hope everything will go well. Uh, my talk will last approximately 45 minutes and after we can have a discussion and I will try to, to answer your questions. So this is the outline of my presentation. So during the first part of the presentation, I will first briefly remind you what the security policy is, and I will review the most important existing access control models. Then in the second part of the presentation, I will talk about three specific access control policies that are used in the web today. I will talk about the course policy, which is a policy for sharing resources between different domains. I will talk about access delegation using the OAuth protocol. That is typically how an individual can grant access to his personal data to a third party application. And finally, I will talk about identity and access management policies. IAM policies are policies enforced in cloud systems like Amazon Web Service, Google Cloud Platform or Microsoft Azure. Please note that authorization is dependent on authentication and session management. So in this presentation, I will focus on authorization only. So let's start the presentation with a few definitions about security and security policy. Cybersecurity can be very simply defined as the protection of the information system against malicious actions. And by information system, I mean all computing, communication, and information infrastructures of an organization. So it includes the network, the computers, the applications, data, and so on. A simple definition of security policy is that it is a set of security rules defining what is allowed and what is not. And in the simplest case, a security policy is a set of permissions, also known as authorizations. And the clause default policy says that anything that is not explicitly allowed is prohibited. So a simple security policy is a set of permissions 
and anything that is not allowed is forbidden. And we shall say that a system is secure if and only if the security policy cannot be violated. And securing a system, that is to say enforcing a security policy, requires security mechanisms. And please try to make a clear distinction between the security policy and the mechanisms to enforce the security policy. These mechanisms are pieces of code that we trust to enforce the security policy. And there are many different types of security mechanisms, authentication mechanisms for authenticating users or computers, access control mechanisms for mediating read and write operations, information flow mechanisms, encryption mechanisms, and so on. So, however, in addition to permissions, a security policy may also include explicit prohibitions. So why is that? Why would I need explicit prohibitions since everything that is not permitted is forbidden? Well, this can be useful to specify exceptions to general permissions. For example, in a parental control system, I may have a general permission authorizing the children to play video games. But there is an exception. The youngest sister is forbidden to play video games. Sometimes also the policy is easier to express through prohibitions. Consider, for example, the prohibition video forbidden to under 80s. So a security policy may include permissions, prohibitions, and what else? Well, a security policy can also include obligations. For example, consider the rule, doctors have the obligation to retain old medical records against possible future need. This is an obligation that doctors should respect. Permission, prohibition, and obligation are concepts that relate to each other. For example, the obligation to do corresponds to the prohibition not to do. And if I apply this relationship to my previous obligation, it becomes doctors are prohibited from not retaining all medical records. And I can translate not retaining by deleting. So in the same way, the non-obligation to do corresponds to the permission not to do. And the permission to do corresponds to the non-prohibition to do. I'll let you think about this. So a security policy is a set of permissions, prohibitions, and obligations. However, these permissions, prohibitions, and obligations may be subject to certain conditions. Since access will or will not be granted based on how conditions evaluate, these conditional security rules are sometimes called dynamic security rules. And we can have temporal conditions. For example, students can use the Wi-Fi during the opening hours of the university. This is a permission subject to a, the temporal condition during the opening hours. Another way of saying it is if the current time is within the university's opening hours, students are allowed to use Wi-Fi. We can have spatial conditions. For example, students are not allowed to connect to their account from outside the university. This is a prohibition subject to the spatial condition from outside the university. We can have provisional condition. A provisional condition is any previous action that the user has performed in the system. For example, after reading the disclaimer, users can install the software package. This is a permission subject to the provisional condition reading the disclaimer. I'm giving you another example. After obtaining your consent, Google may use your location data. This is a permission subject to the provisional condition obtaining your consent. So for your information, permissions that depend on provisional conditions are sometimes called provisional authorizations. And you can have many other types of conditioning. And in fact, the 
only practical limit is whether or not the computer system can evaluate these conditions. There is no point in writing security rules that cannot be implemented. So now we can have a better definition of security policy. We shall define a security policy as a list of security rules where each rule is either a permission, a prohibition or an obligation depending possibly on certain conditions. And one more word about these conditions. If you read the literature on security policy, these conditions are sometimes referred to as contexts. So security policies that mix permissions and prohibitions should include what is called a conflict resolution policy. That is a strategy that should apply when conflicts arise between security rules. So I will not go into details, but there may be several strategies. One of them is, for example, prohibition prevails. That is, in case of conflict, the system will apply the prohibition. Another example, a concrete example, is the conflict resolution policy that is used in firewalls. You know these packet filters. The security policy of a firewall is a set of accept deny rules. That is to say, permissions and prohibitions. And these rules can conflict with each other. And the conflict resolution policy that is used in firewalls is simply the first rule that should apply is the first rule that matches in sequential order. So the order of the rules is very important. So now that I have recalled the concept of security policy, I will review the most common existing access control models. And first of all, why are these models called access control models? Well, they are called access control models because the security policy can be implemented by means of access control mechanisms. That is trusted pieces of code implementing the security policy by regulating access to resources. Now, what distinguishes these models from each other? Well, what distinguishes these models from each other is the security policy. Each model has its own type of security policy that is suitable for a given type of application or system. So the most common type of the most common type of security policy is the discretionary access control policy, where the security rules are based on the identity of users. That is security rules like Alice has the right to read that file. Bob has the right to modify that file and so on. Security rules explicitly refer to user identity. What characterizes the discretionary access control policy also is that administration, its administration relies on the concept of ownership, which means that users define the security policy protecting their own resources, their own files. The DAC policy is in fact almost everywhere. All existing operating systems implement the DAC policy, where users can define the security policy regarding their own files. For example, it is implemented in Windows, in Unix, and in SQL. A specific DAC policy can be modeled by an access control matrix, where the lines represent the subjects and the columns represent the objects. And a cell of the matrix contains all the actions that the subject has the right to perform on the object. For example, by reading this matrix, we can see that Alice has the permission to read, write, and execute object code. And Bob has the right to read and execute object code. So this is how a specific DAC policy can be modeled. And as you can see, it's in fact very simple. So let's see now how to represent the DAC access control matrix. Represented as such in memory is not an option for two reasons. First, it is huge, and second, it is very sparse. So a lot of memory would be wasted. In fact, there are two solutions to implement the matrix within the computer system. The first solution is to create a, lit a list of authorizations 
for the non-empty cells associated with a column, knowing that a column represents an object. And this list is called an access control list. So we have one access control list per object. And the second solution is to create a list of authorizations for the non-empty cells associated with a line and knowing that the line represents a subject. So this list is called a list of capabilities. So we have one list of capabilities per subject. So let me show this to you by using our small example of matrix. Let us first consider the column corresponding to the authorizations associated with object code. From this column, we can derive the access control list of object code. Let us consider now the line corresponding to the authorizations associated with subject Alice. From this line, we can derive the list of capabilities of subject Alice. And in the same way, we can also derive the access control list of object data and the list of capabilities of subject Bob. So access control list and capabilities are two solutions to represent the DAC policy within the system. Another type of security policy is the mandatory access control policy, where the security rules are mandatory and cannot be modified even by a security administrator. So there is more, there are more than one mandatory access control policy. Examples of mandatory policy are uh, first the same origin policy, which restricts information flows between the browser and the host computer and between the different web applications. And I will talk about this same origin policy later. But the most famous example is the multi-level security policy, whose aim is to preserve the confidentiality of data in a military setting. So I do not present the multi-level security policy because it is of little interest for the web. And today I am interested in the web. The role-based access control RBAC policy is a security policy in which security rules are based on user roles within an organization. So it is a policy for commercial organizations mostly. Security rules do not refer to users, but, but to roles. And a role corresponds to a function in the organization, like manager, accountant, and so on. Roles are then assigned to users according to their function in the organization. And roles can be hierarchically organized. So as examples of system implementing RBAC, I can mention the Teams platform you are currently using to watch this presentation. It is RBAC based. Oracle SQL was extended to support the concept of all. Identity and access management components of cloud systems implement also the RBAC policy. And actually, we will see an example of RBAC policy when I will present IAM policies. So we we'll talk again, I will talk again about RBAC a little bit later. And the last access control model I want to talk about is the attribute based access control model. The ABAC policy is a security policy in which security rules are conditional. And a condition is based on certain attribute values relating to the user, the data protected by the rule, the object, or the environment of the user or the object. The ABAC policy has high expressive power and consists of rules which can be represented by if-then statements. So it's difficult to identify one commercial product implementing the ABAC policy. However, I would like to mention this company, Axiomatics, which has become a specialist in developing systems implementing the ABAC policy. So very briefly, let me show you a few examples of ABAC security rules. The first rule says that students are permitted to use Wi-Fi between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. So in this rule, role is an attribute of subject S, type is an attribute of object O, and time is an attribute of the environment. 
This second example says one may use the Wi-Fi from inside the building only. GPS position is an attribute of the subject. It indicates the location of the subject. In security perimeter is simply a predicate to verify that the location is inside the building. Type is an attribute of object O. And this second rule is actually interesting because it shows that subjects can be granted privileges without authenticating themselves, simply by checking some of their attribute values. In this example, knowledge of the subject's GPS position is sufficient to allow him to use object of type Wi-Fi. So ABAC rules activate when their condition is true. So verifying conditions means authenticating attributes. So in the examples on the previous slide, I used mathematical notation to express security rules. I used predicate logic. Of course, one cannot write security rules using predicate logic. XACMEL is an XML-based language standard for specifying ABAC rules. However, XACMEL is a machine-readable policy language, so it is not user-friendly. XACMEL offers several strategies for solving conflicts between permissions and prohibitions, like deny overrides, first applicable, and so on. The XACMEL standard also defines a processing model for evaluating access requests according to ABAC rules. And this processing model is interesting, so I will describe it. So this figure describes everything, in fact. Assumes, assume a user, say Alice here, submits a request. And the request is to view record one, two, three. The policy enforcement point intercepts the request and sends it to the policy decision point. Can Alice view record one, two, three? The PDP is the intelligent component of the XACMEL processing system. It can be implemented with an inference engine. The PDP first queries the security policy. It selects all the rules that potentially match the request. It then queries the policy information point to retrieve some attribute values. And from the rules it has selected, and from the attribute values it has read, the PDP selects the rule that will activate. And the PDP resolves conflict between activated ABAC rules and returns the decision access granted or access denied. In our case, it is access granted. The, de the decision is transmitted to the policy enforcement point, which enforces it. That is, it retrieves record one, two, three and transfers it to Alice. And I should not forget to mention the policy administration point. This is the component that allows the security administrator to update the security policy. So that's it about access control models. Now in the second part of this presentation, I will look at three authorization management strategies that are commonly used on the web and in the cloud. And I will start by presenting how resources can be shared using a cross-origin resource sharing policy. But before presenting the course policy, I must say a few words about browser security. So web browser security is about security on the client side of a web application. As you know, a browser can run multiple web applications. For example, here is an overview of my browser that is connected to two applications. One is my university's web application. The other is the Reddit application. And there is a tab for each application. And basically, the purpose of web browser security is twofold. Firstly, to protect the computer from malicious code, such as malicious JavaScript, that might be included in downloaded HTML pages. 
And it is also to isolate the content of different applications from each other. Concretely, there should be no interaction between the university's web application and the Reddit application. So let's look at the first protection mechanism, which is the one that protects the computer against malicious code that may be included in HTML pages. To protect the computer against malicious code, downloaded scripts run in a sandbox. And a sandbox is a security mechanism, an information flow mechanism that prevents scripts from accessing the host computer. Basically, the security policy, which is hard coded in the sandbox mechanism, says that downloaded scripts cannot create or write files. It says also that downloaded scripts can read files, but this is only allowed by letting the user select the file. Now, in order to isolate the content of different web applications, the downloaded scripts are constrained by the same origin policy. And the same origin policy is an important policy to know if you are, if you are a web developer. The same origin policy is a mandatory policy. It states that scripts downloaded in the context of a given web application do not have access to data related to another web application. So I will not define what an origin is. You can search on the web. The Wikipedia page is very clear about this topic. But you may simply think as an origin being a domain. And most modern browsers enforce this mandatory policy. So why is this policy important? Consider the following example where one of my browser tab is connected to my bank account and the other to a website returning an HTML page containing malicious JavaScript. If the same origin policy wasn't applied, the malicious JavaScript could steal the authentication cookie related to the connection with my bank. And this malicious script could simply order certain fraudulent transactions on my behalf. So the same origin policy is for isolating the different web applications from each other. The same origin policy is very important. However, sometimes it is necessary to relax it. Consider the client of a web application performing AJAX cross-domain queries. The loaded web page is from domain A and includes a JavaScript requesting resources from domain A. These requests, which are not cross-domain, are always allowed by the same origin policy. <coughs> However, the JavaScript includes also some requests to domain B. And these requests are prohibited by the same origin policy, which is enforced in the browser unless they are falling within the scope of a course policy. So for this, for this request to be authorized by the browser, the domain B server must be a course server. That is a server implementing a course policy and allowing domain A to access to its resources. So in order to explain how it works, I have to make a clear distinction between the Ajax client and the browser itself. That is the trusted component enforcing the same origin policy and the course policy. First, the JavaScript sends a request to domain B server. This request is in a way intercepted by the browser. And instead of sending the actual request, the browser sends a pre-flight request. And the purpose of this request is to ensure that the browser is dealing with a course server and to obtain permission to send the actual request to the course server. Domain B server is a course server. It maintains a white list of authorized domains. And domain A is included in this list. So the response to the pre-flight request sent by the course server 
includes a list of specific course HTTP headers. And the value of these headers indicates that the course server will accept the actual request. Since the response to the pre-flight request is positive, the browser then sends the actual request. If it, if it was negative, it would have blocked the actual request. Domain B server responds and the response is delivered to the JavaScript. This is basically how course works. So this summarizes what I have just said. The response to the pre-flight request sent by the course server includes a list of specific course, course HTTP headers and the value of these headers indicates whether the course server will accept the actual request. If the response to the pre-flight request is positive, then the browser sends the actual request. Otherwise, the actual request is blocked by the browser. A course server maintains a whitelist of authorized domains unless it exposes a public API. And in that case, the server will accept requests sent by clients from any domain. <coughs> so the course policy is in fact a DAC policy addressing domains individually. And the default policy is the mandatory same origin policy. So do not forget that the course policy is defined by the course server. Course server is the owner of the resources. This course policy is the whitelist of the authorized domains, which is the kind of simple access control list. And this policy is enforced by the browser, which is the trusted component. To finish with the presentation, of course, and since I don't want you to get lost, let me remind you the case study of the two applications, MyBank and Evil.com. I don't know if, um, if MyBank is a course server or not. If it is not a course server, then the same origin policy applies, of course. And if it is a course server, then one thing is sure is that it doesn't have Evil.com in its whitelist of authorized domains. So regarding a, a potential JavaScript loaded from evil.com trying to interact with my bank, the same origin policy would apply and would block the JavaScript from interacting with resources from my bank. The second authorization management strategy I want to present today is the access delegation using the OAuth protocol. So suppose you are interacting with a web application that wants to access to your Google profile. So of course, you may give your Google, your Google credentials to this application, but this would be totally insecure. The OAuth protocol is a solution that is commonly used on the internet to grant access to resources without disclosing credentials. It essentially relies on access tokens which are issued to third party applications by an authorization server with the approval of the user, the user being the resource owner. OAuth is used by companies such as Google or Facebook to allow users to securely share information about their accounts with third party applications. Let me explain how it works. Let us consider the resource server which hosts the user's Google account. Let us consider the browser. And suppose the user who is the resource owner is interacting with a third party application, the Zoom video application, the Zoom video conferencing system. And this application wants to access to the user's agenda. And finally, let us consider the Google authorization server. OAuth offers several possible flows to manage the interactions between the third party application, the authorization server and the resource server. Here I will describe the most used and most secure flow, which is called the authorization code flow. The third party application server has previously registered with Google and obtained an ID and a secret S. 
the third party application offers the user to log in with Google. Then the browser is automatically redirected to the authorization server. And the request to the authorization server includes a scope. That is the requested permission, which is in our example, the permission to access to the user's Google agenda. The user submits his credential. The user is then presented with a screen asking for authorization to access his Google agenda. And this is how the screen looks like. So this is the third party application, the Zoom application. And this is the scope, that is the permission, the requested permission. If the user clicks on the allow button, then he gives his consent for the requested scope to the third party application. The authorization server returns an authorization code to the browser that automatically sends it to the third, appli third party application server. The third party application server sends the client ID, the secret S, and the authorization code to obtain an access token in exchange. This token is then attached to the request that the third party application server submits to the resource server. And finally, the resource server validates the token and responds to the application request. So this is how OAuth works. And this protocol is very commonly used on the web. So one question you may ask is why the access token is not directly sent to the browser by the authorization server instead of using this intermediate step involving an authorization code. This is because the browser is not considered totally secure. It is more secure to send the access token to the third party application server. However, I should mention that there is another flow, simpler but less secure, which is called the implicit flow where there is no authorization code and where the access token is directly sent to the browser. What about the validity of this token? It depends on the case. The access token can be short term, valid only for the current session, or long term, valid for several days. And in that case, it should be noted that the access token can even be used by the third party application when the user is offline. Since I talk about course, let me mention that the authorization server doesn't have to be a course server since it communicates directly with the browser and the browser is trusted. So the, the, the authorization server does not communicate with any JavaScript. The same applies to the resource server. It doesn't have to be a course server since it only communicates with the application server and not with the browser in any, any way. The access control model underlying the OAuth protocol is basically the DAC model in which users grant permissions to third parties to access their personal data. A permission is implemented as an access token that is a capacity. The authorization server issues access tokens and the resource server validates them. So it's possible to combine OAuth with XACML to handle ABAC dynamic authorizations that is conditional permissions. It's possible, I read a couple of papers about it, but there is no standard way of doing it. In this presentation, I talked only about OAuth as an authorization delegation protocol. Let me, let me mention that the widely used OpenID Connect is an identity layer on top of the OAuth protocol, allowing authentication, delegation, and web single sign on but I do not talk about it since I only focus on authorizations. One thing interesting is that the OAuth protocol can be used to build APIs that comply with the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. Why is that? Well, you know that the GDPR imposes on processing entities 
the obligation to obtain the consent of the subject entities before using their personal data. And it is exactly what the OAuth protocol enables. OAuth must, however, be implemented with the token revocation extension to allow users to revoke an access token at any time, since the withdrawal of consent is also one of the subject's rights under the GDPR. Finally, a last word about OAuth. If you want to understand it fully, I highly recommend you to play with it, to play with it at this URL. This is a playground to experiment with OAuth. So in the last part of this presentation, I will talk about identity and access management policies in the cloud. So as you probably know, a single cloud account in an infrastructure as a service can be used to set up a virtual organization managing several users and resources like databases, virtual computers, virtual networks, and so on. So I'm not a specialist of these cloud systems. I have not used them much, but I read about their security. And what I noticed is that they all have this IAM web service. This IAM component is for authenticating users first and also managing the security policy, regulating the access to the various resources of the cloud account. And what I also noticed is that these cloud systems, whether they are from Amazon, Google, or Microsoft, well, they more or less implement the same security model. So I'm going to present a kind of generic access control model that approximately represents the different access control models which are used in these cloud systems. Also, this presentation is about access control and authorization. So I will not talk about the authentication function of the IAM system. So in fact, the security model used in this cloud platform is an access control model combining features from several access control paradigms. And this security model includes the following entities. The subjects, which are the users or the applications, the resources, and the resources are basically anything that needs to be protected. The authorization policies, which consist of permissions and or prohibitions. The groups, a group is simply a set of subjects, and the rules, and the rule is a set of authorization policies. So subjects can belong to more than one group, and this is the same in the DAX system. Resources are hierarchically organized so that giving access to a certain high-level resource implicitly grants access to the resources which are under it. A security policy or a security rule is the authorization or the prohibition to do a set of actions on a set of resources. It possibly includes a contextual condition. And this contextual condition is clearly an ABAC feature. A policy can be attached to a subject, a group, or a role. You see that this is more than the traditional RBAC model. In the RBAC model, a policy can be attached to a role only. Roles can be hierarchically organized, like in the traditional RBAC model. Roles can be assigned to subjects or groups. The conflict resolution policy is denial prevails. In case of conflict between two policies, that is between a permission and a prohibition, denial prevails. So to give you a better intuition of the security policies that we can implement with an IIM system, I am now showing a small case study. I consider a set of roles a set of users, a set of policies, and a set of groups. And actually, there is only one group. Bob has been assigned the database administrator role, which consists of a policy allowing read and write access on the entire database. Resource DB is a high-level resource allowing to address the entire database. I chose the database as, a, as an example, but I could have chosen any other asset. 
Alice and John are members of the group Sales Agent. Group Sales Agent has been assigned the role Sales Management, allowing read and write access on schemas, pro products, and stock. Oops, sorry for that. Guest is an external user who has been assigned the role customer, allowing to query the schema products. Roles can also be temporarily assigned to subjects belonging to other cloud accounts, allowing cross-domain authorization. Customer is a temporary role assigned to guest. So this small case study summarizes the kind of policy we can implement with the IAM component of a cloud system. And the security model used in this cloud system is essentially an RBAC security model with features borrowed from other access control paradigms, from the DAC paradigm and from the ABAC paradigm. Even if in my small, small case study, you couldn't see it since there was no conditional authorization and no prohibition. You have noticed that a set of users, a set of low level resources and a set of policies can be represented as a group a high level resource and a role respectively. And this systematic clustering of entities is a characteristic of the ORBAC model, which is another access control model, which I didn't have time to present. And this clustering of entities is an important feature because it allows for a better structuration of the poli security policy. Regarding the organization of the trusted components, evaluating and enforcing access control policies in existing cloud platforms. In fact, very little information can be found in the literature. But one may reasonably assume that this organization follows the exact mail architecture I presented earlier. So in order to conclude this presentation, I would like to, to mention one big problem with cloud security. And this issue needs to be addressed to encourage companies or individuals to adopt the cloud. The problem is very simple. How can an individual or a company trust the cloud provider? The authorization policy does not apply to the cloud provider. The cloud provider has therefore full access to the customer's data. And as you have probably guessed, encrypting the data using standard encryption isn't really the solution, since data need to be decrypted before being processed. And when the data is decrypted, then it becomes vulnerable. There is a solution that is called homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption is a type of encryption that allows encrypted data to be processed. However, it's difficult to implement and none of the cloud computing providers I mentioned earlier implement homomorphic encryption. However, I should mention that IBM has recently published a fully homomorphic encryption toolkit, which looked promising. But I'm not a specialist of homomorphic encryption, so I cannot really judge on that. But I give you the URL where you can download this toolkit and have a look at it. This is at least a first step toward homomorphic encryption implemented in cloud systems. However, homomorphic encryption to protect data is not everything, since code itself can also convey sensitive information. And code should also be protected from the cloud provider. And for example, suppose you are a researcher, and suppose you are running a highly innovative machine learning program in the cloud, you certainly don't want the cloud provider to have a look at it. So this issue needs also to be addressed. That's it. Thank you very much. So this was a presentation on access control and authorization policies in the web. I hope you, you enjoyed it and uh, I am now open to questions. Thank you, Alban, and um, for your presentation. Very clear and very pedagogic, and uh, um, and that's uh, interesting.
Um, I see a couple of questions which are being published and you may see them. Um, the first one, is it possible to get the resource after the presentation? Maybe you can comment. Uh, available. Yes, of course I can. I I, I think I, I I already sent you my my PDF. Yeah. Uh, I can send the PDF. Uh, I don't know. I can give you the PDF. Maybe you can put it online somewhere. There is no problem about this. Yeah. Yes. So it's what I say. So video recording also has been uh, is performed. Uh, there will be a YouTube version for you, uh, of course, uh, also available uh, on that to my academy plus uh, the PDF. OK, so that's one one thing. Um, I, I have a, a one a, one question, a global question. Uh, you give a very uh, interesting um, incremental um, presentation about access control models uh, from uh, how say centralized systems to to the cloud and um, with a very interesting uh, uh, layer of security um, what about today um, there is a major demand for instance uh, today in the in the press you can see a lot of questions concerning um, crypto money concerning blockchain uh, students will have a course on blockchain and um, here we're talking about asymmetry cryptography. Um, I know that you you are addressing that point in your course, but here could you make a comment on the security mechanisms globally, which are um, um, followed by blockchain and uh, crypto money? Well, I mean, regarding crypto, Regarding the blockchain, what I can say and regarding the blockchain applied to authorization policy since this is the, the topic uh, of today. Regarding the blockchain applied to uh, authorization policy, what I can say that they, they have been proposals uh, to, to distribute a security policy with a blockchain. And consider, for example, an IoT environment uh, well, there are many sensors, many distributed sensors, large networks. You want the security policy to be the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. So a solution to synchronize the policy uh, everywhere uh, is to use the blockchain. And at the same time, it is a trusted component. So you can trust the blockchain. You can trust the security policy represented within the blockchain. So uh, the block, I mean, regarding security policy, which is uh, the, the today's topic, uh, this is one application of the blockchain. OK. Mm. There is a question concerning IAM. Um, yes. Somebody say, I don't really get the issue with the IAM cloud service. Could you uh, do a second pass or repeat some uh, aspects concerning it? Uh, the issue, uh, I mean, did the person did not understand what I said, or is it related to the to the to the the last problem I mentioned in cloud security? I don't know whether it's last problem concerning the cloud provider itself. I think it's just maybe some uh, extra comments on what is AIM um, for concerning the cloud. IAM is is a component, uh, a web service that you that you find in all uh, existing cloud platforms, and this component is used to, it is used for authentication first, and it is used also to set up the the security policy protecting the assets uh, of the cloud account. And if you have an account on Amazon, for example, an infrastructure as a service, and you you can set up a complete organization, a complete virtual organization with computers, uh, database, uh, networks, and so on. So you have to set up a security policy protecting uh, all these assets. And you do this with the IAM components, yeah, which is a kind of uh, a web service. So I was interested, in fact, since uh, you have noticed it uh, during my presentation, I was interested in one 
what type of security policy you can implement in this, with these IAM systems. And in fact, I realized that uh, they are mostly RBAC based and they more or less all these IAM systems, whether they are from Microsoft, from Amazon, from Google, they more or less implement the same security model, which I, I tried to describe very briefly using a small case study. That's all. But there was no specific issue. I mean, I just wanted to describe what kind of security model, what kind of security policy you can implement with an IAM system. I hope okay. I, I, I answered the question. Yeah, that was for me, that was a clear question, uh, answer to the question. Mm. Um, I don't see any new questions and um, I know students will have the pleasure to interact with you every night from uh, in France, every morning for you. I know that you are in good shape, so uh, early morning is not an issue for you. And um, at the end of the week, I will be a pleasure to 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 wrap uh, the discussion with you and to but um, uh, I would like to thank you and um, well just because I, I found a complete reference on December the 18 um, uh, the jobs which are considered on LinkedIn are the 15 most promise, promising jobs in the future from LinkedIn in terms of computing you have AI engineer, data engineer, data scientist, data consultant, big data developer, which are part of the BR curriculum. But then you have cybersecurity manager in top, and you just have also inside company a new job. You know, there are the chief operating officer, chief executive officer. There will be the chief data protection officer. So that's part of a high responsibility we means around uh, data security in the future of every company and that's a highly demand job so for students listening to your talk that's an area of uh, inversion of prime importance so i don't see any new question alban i would like to thank you deeply and uh, wish you a very good day today for you and um, thank you Serge. and nice discussion with the students and thank you a lot you were uh, brilliant as usual, <laughs> easy and brilliant. OK, so keep Thank on. Thank you very much, Serge. Talk with you soon and um, and bye bye. And bye, bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.